Good morning. I'm sure we'll continue to have people come in, and it's great to not have any chairs left on the front, in front of the, on this side of the bar. Um, we have some new people who have joined us this morning. Uh, first, so that our new people know who I am, I'm Ann Burkholder. I'm the Associate Dean of Methodist Studies at Candler School of Theology, and I um, agreed to help uh, set up these morning briefings for students who are here in attendance at General Conference. So we have a sizable group here in attendance from Shenandoah University. And so if you all will just raise your hand so that we can welcome you. Great, yeah, quite a, quite a group. Um, um, it's a distinct, oh, let me just say this, we are live streaming. So if you don't want to be on the camera, you need to sit behind the camera. Some of you have heard me say that almost every morning. And um, after I introduce our guest for the morning, uh, he'll have a time to do a present, short presentation, and then there'll be lots of time for questions. So you'll be able to come to this microphone uh, for your questions. Um, and Adam will be standing up here. We'll be able to do some dialogue. Okay. Okay. Great question. I the ar the question is: Are these being archived? And I found out from our communication specialist Harry this morning that not only are they being live streamed, but they are being archived. So you'll be able to access them after the general conference. All right. I think it's an important day to begin with prayer. <laughs> Not that every day isn't, but, <laughs> but uh, today is a especially important day to begin with prayer. Oh, gracious God, we know you're in our midst. Um, sometimes we um, just don't take the time to notice and appreciate how you love and care for us. Uh, so we really invite you to be it's very present and visible with us um, in our time this morning. Um, and that you are able to speak in and through our guest, Adam Hamilton, um, as he shares his heart with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Where'd you go? <laughs> It's with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce to you Reverend Adam, Adam Hamilton, who is the pastor of Church of the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. Um, Adam has been um, an informal leader in the life of the of not just the General Conference but the whole church over the years, as uh, Church of the Resurrection has become Church of the Resurrection you know, has become um, the largest. United Methodist Church in our connection. And so with great pleasure, Adam, please come and share with us this morning. Thank you. It's good to be with you today. Harry, is this okay if I stand here for you guys on the camera? Okay. Well, it's nice to meet you all. I'm really thrilled that you're here at General Conference. Uh, how, how many of you are getting credit for this at uh, college or, or a seminary? Okay. So uh, that's awesome. For those of you who are here and you're not getting credit, way to go. That's really a... <laughs> Uh, that's awesome, too. Uh, so this is an interesting day for us to be together, and I want to share with you some things that are sort of late-breaking developments that you might have got wind of on uh, Twitter or Facebook. Um, but first, I just want to say a word about United Methodism. I joined the United Methodist Church in college. I was a Methodist when I was a kid for a couple of years, but un you know, sort of against my will. My parents made us go to church. My uh, father was, uh, grew up Roman Catholic and was a faithful Catholic. Uh, well. His mother was a faithful Catholic. He was not really a faithful Catholic. But uh, he grew up Catholic. My, uh, my mother grew up in the Church of Christ, which, uh, which in 1964, the year I was born, I'm 51, so you don't have to do the math. Um, in 1964, it would be hard to find two more opposite expressions of the Christian faith than the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of Christ. Roman Catholics weren't really that aware of the Church of Christ. It was just a little schismatic group of wannabe Christians. Uh, and you may know the Church of Christ... Uh, you know, their idea was to go all the way back to the New Testament, be New Testament Christians. There were no musical instruments or no organs in the uh, New Testament church, and so they uh, eliminated organs from their churches. They sing a cappella, uh, you know, very sort of more fundamental Christians. And, of course, you know quite a bit about the Catholic Church, I think. And, uh, and so my mom and dad got married, and my, uh, uh, my grandmother insisted I be baptized Catholic, 
But my parents, my mom was never going to become Catholic. My dad was never going to become Church of Christ. And so their answer to religion was just not to go to church. That was a dilemma. They just wouldn't go to church. So uh, finally, when my parents were aiming towards a divorce when I was 11 years old, they thought, actually, I was eight when they first did this. They uh, said, maybe if we go to church, it'll help save our marriage. So they tried to find a church that was somewhere between Roman Catholic and Church of Christ. And they ended up in a Methodist church. And, and I mention that because Methodists are sort of halfway between this and that. We uh, pursue what we call the Via Media. Episcopalians also talk about this. The Via Media is the middle way. And consequently, in Methodism, you find a really big tent. And that tent includes people who are progressive, and it includes people who are conservative, and a whole lot of people who are somewhere in the middle. And it doesn't mean a sort of mishy-mashy, wishy-washy middle. It means uh, what some would call, in one of my books I call the radical center. Bishop Scott Jones talks about the extreme center. But this place where you stand and say, there is truth on both sides of this divide, almost always. So part of the problem we have in, in Congress today is that the Republicans continually try to to uh, block the Democrats, the Democrats block the Republicans. If a Republican proposes it, the Democrats can oppose it and vice versa. And that's just a broken way of trying to address anything uh, because often there's truth on both sides. And if the two would come together and find a via media, a middle way where they could work together and find the strengths of both, we would actually probably have a pretty effective country. And that's the way our system was designed to work. It's just not working that way. The United Methodist Church is the same. So people ask me this question on a regular basis. Adam, are you liberal or conservative? People who want to join Church of the Resurrection, they come and they visit for four or five Sundays and they say, I just can't figure you out. Are you liberal or conservative? And my answer is always the same. Yes, of course. And they say, no, no, no. Which? Are you liberal or conservative? And I'm like, well, do I have to pick between those two? Because I actually think those are both pretty good ideas. Uh, if you look up the dictionary definition of liberal, it means to be generous, willing to share, open to reform, open to new ideas. Who doesn't want to be that? And if you're conserving, uh, the, and by the way, liberal comes from the, you know, the uh, Latin word, which is for freedom. And there's an em emphasis on individual rights. And liberals have sort of been known in uh, the United States, when we take the more common vernacular, as people who are concerned for social justice, people who are concerned for uh, you know, rights, these kinds of things. When you talk about uh, conservative, uh, it comes from the word to conserve or to preserve traditional values, things that were important. They may not be in style anymore, but they're still true, and so we, we need to hold to those things, to be careful about how we spend our money, to be, uh, you know, to be responsible with the assets that have been given to you. Who doesn't want to be that? Of course that's a good thing. And so, you know, as Methodists, at our best, we are liberal conservatives sometimes, and sometimes we're conservative liberals. And, uh, and we try to listen to both sides. This is also true in a host of different ways. So uh, some people say, well, we're the church of the both and, not the either or. Uh, we are a church that embraces both the evangelical gospel and the social gospel. The evangelical gospel says that, that there's something in us that needs to be healed or repaired. We can call it sin. And, and Christ came to be our redeemer. And it's in relationship to Christ we find ourselves born anew and transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit and becoming the people God wants us to be. But our salvation isn't simply to get our butts to heaven. And it's not simply to, you know, sort of have this kind of narcissistic me and Jesus kind of faith. It's to change us so that we also might be a part of God's strategic plan to heal a broken world. So there's both the social gospel and the evangelical gospel. And, and we believe in both grace and holiness. So grace says that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, so far shall the Lord remove your sins from you. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And holiness says, but God hopes that we don't stay in our brokenness and our messed up lives, but instead that we are being transformed into Christ's likeness. And in both personal ways and, and in uh, terms of social holiness. And so Methodism, this is what I love about the Methodist Church. It's how I ended up joining the Methodist Church once I was in college. Is I thought, this is what I've been looking for. And a church that emphasizes both the head and the heart. And so I came, out of a, I came to faith in a Pentecostal church where it was all about emotion and feeling. And, and that was awesome. But I had, this, I had lots of questions, theological questions. And Methodists are people who don't check your brain at the door of the church. But instead are encouraged to think. So this big tent is a wonderful thing, but it also creates tension in that tent. And that tension uh, between those who lean far more conservative and those who lean far more progressive. And so you've got sort of two far ends in our tent. 
And on the far ends, it's harder and harder to see the value of the person on the other side. And you see some of the value. It's not that you don't value them at all, but it's harder sometimes when you're on the far ends. And then you come in, and as you move progressively you know, closer to the center, you're willing to deal with ambiguity, uh, sometimes with paradox. And you're also willing to embrace the fact that I, I may never agree with you, but I think you probably have some important things to say. And I'm willing to allow for the fact that you could be right and I could be wrong. I don't think you're right. I think I'm right, but you could be right. You know, to allow some sort of place to meet in the middle. So uh, today, the last few days, actually the last few years, three years ago, uh, there were a group of more conservative pastors in our connection, uh, some of whom are friends of mine, who said we really... Uh, when it comes to, and, and the precipitating issue was, the presenting issue was same gender relationships, as you know. But there were a whole lot of other issues, uh, you know, about how we do ministry and, and how, and theology and these kind of things. But they said, we really can't see that this is, that we're ever going to get along the way we should get along in the United Methodist Church. And we're calling for what they named an amicable separation. That is, we would like to be able to leave and to take our property with us. That's the am amicable part. So a divorce, but a friendly divorce, so please let us take our property. Now you know, or may know, that in our polity we have something called the Trust Clause. And the Trust Clause says that all of the property of the United Methodist Church is owned, uh, it's kept in trust by the local church on behalf of the annual conference, and in essence sort of owned by the entire connection. And, and so if somebody wants to leave the denomination, the buildings stay uh, with the United Methodist Church and that particular annual conference. And so an amicable separation would mean we can take our buildings with us for a nominal fee. You know, we agree we need to pay something, but, you know, maybe one year's apportionments, something like that, and then let us go. And we'll go and bless each other and we'll, we'll t talk nice to each other. I don't know how many of you have ever been through a divorce proceedings. Often they'll start that way, not always, but often they'll start like, hey, let's be friends, we'll love each other, it's really great, we'll just kind of figure out how to... But my mom was divorced five times, and I can tell you it doesn't, uh, doesn't always work out that way by the time you get through with the divorce. And so uh, when I first heard about this, I thought, wait, are you telling me that you can't be in the same church with me anymore? Like there's something either so defective or wrong with my theology and my faith that you can't participate with me, even though I'm an evangelical and you consider yourselves evangelical and we're not fighting over orthodox tenets of Christian faith because all of those things I teach. Uh, we're fighting over how we interpret the scripture related to s people who are gay and lesbian. And, uh, and that's a big enough issue for you that you say you can't be in the same church with me. Now I'm presenting... I, I happen to be the guy who has the microphone right now, and I'm sharing my particular perspective on this. And if I had Rob Renfro here with me who heads up the more conservative group, he might express it somewhat differently. So I flew down to Tennessee, and I met with one of the leaders, the sort of long-time leaders of the movement. I said, hey, can we get together? And we went out, and we had barbecue together. And we uh, walked for three hours and talked about where the church is and, and agreed that we you know, are brothers in Christ and... But we came away and I said, come on, let's work together for trying to find a better solution than this. And, uh, and he said, well, I'd really like to, but I'm just not sure we can. I said, well, let's just at least try. Let's figure out if there's some better way. So I uh, came out of that meeting. And for the last three years, I've been in and out of dozens of meetings with different segments and groups uh, trying to see if there was a way, a better way, than dividing the denomination. And I think the group that was, is most interested in dividing at this point is maybe 10% maybe of our churches, but that's 3,200 churches, which is a pretty, that's a pretty sizable group of churches. And of those 3,200 churches, there are at least a disproportionate number who are larger churches in the South. And, uh, and so when it comes to the percentage of apportionment dollars that pay for all of our general boards and agencies and our mission work and all that, it's probably maybe 20% of apportionment dollars. And so, um, so I've been in all these meetings, and so far it has been impossible to find a way. Uh, some of you may know I wrote a document uh, a couple of years ago that was called A Way Forward. And there's been all kinds of different things, like a third way, and there's different, you know, but A Way Forward said, uh, we can keep the current language, more restrictive language, can we soften it just a little bit? But can we also create a provision that recognizes that United Methodist of uh, deep faith and conviction 
disagree on how we interpret these scriptures and make a provision for local churches to set their own wedding policies and local church pastors to decide who they will or won't marry, which is already allowed for in the discipline. It's already the rule in the discipline, except when it comes to same gender people. And so conservatives continue to hold a more conservative practice. We recognize the language in our discipline as the historic language. We, um, we let local churches decide uh, their own wedding policies. And so a pastor might want to do same gender weddings, but a local church might say, we're not ready to do that. So the pastor can do it at the park or somewhere else. You know, so trying to find this path that might uh, protect. And so in Africa, where this is a big concern, uh, Africans would not adopt this. You know, I mean, they would be those folks who would say, we continue to hold to the historic teaching. We don't do, our churches don't do same gender weddings. Our pastors don't do same gender weddings. There was no, and there was no reason for anyone to vote. The, the way we wrote it up was that uh, the historic position would continue to be your position until such a time as you decided to change your position or to opt for an, an alternative to that. And so most churches wouldn't vote. They just continue as they are. But those churches who felt a deep conviction about uh, this is a social justice issue and interpreted those scriptures differently had a mechanism to be able to do that. But that was deemed uh, by the more conservative side as something that was not acceptable. And basically it was said uh, by some that we can't be in a church where there are some pastors who are doing this because we feel so strongly that this is a biblical issue and this violates our sense of conscience when it comes to the Bible. That we can't even be in the same fellowship if there's somebody. So then there began to be talk about, well, could we divide the denomination into two jurisdictions in the United States? Or maybe you know, make the U.S. a central conference, which, has been, which is an important thing for us to do no matter what. But uh, you know, is there some way to divide this so people could opt into the liberal uh, jurisdiction or they could opt into the conservative jurisdiction and the jurisdictions would no longer be geographical? I'm guessing you all have studied some of these options. And, uh, and for some people that look like, well, that's just a prelude to splitting. It's just a way of getting us to there. And then that particular jurisdiction eventually votes to leave. But now they have control over their property as they do it. And so not everybody on the left was excited about that prospect. And uh, so we found ourselves stuck again. So anyway, we come here to General Conference. And I, I think a lot of folks had a feeling that, you know, this General Conference, we're going to see a little bit of movement. And that movement will be at least we're going to agree that we disagree, and we'll, we'll formally recognize that in the Book of Discipline, that, that not everyone sees this issue the same way. Um, that maybe we can soften the language that says that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching and find some, some gentler way of saying that if we're going to continue to hold a conservative view of this. And, and I hoped at the very least we would also come to the paragraph that says that officiating at same gender marriages is a chargeable offense and pull that off the list of chargeable offenses. There's a lot of things that you are not supposed to do in the discipline that you are not charged for and brought on church trial. So my hope was to see at least those three things if you couldn't move the ball further down the road. And uh, my sense has been that, uh, that we will figure out how the U.S. is a central conference at some point, and that at some point the number of delegates in the U.S. who see same-gender relationships in a more progressive way are going to outnumber the number who see it more conservatively. That's already the case in the US, actually. If you were to vote just with US delegates today, we would change all of these things. Um, but when we got into legislative committee, so when General Conference opened, uh, there was uh, a, a couple of meetings that happened fairly early on um, where once more, you know, for the conservative folks, they were like, we just can't, we just don't want to keep doing this. We don't want to keep being in a place where we feel like we're snubbed, where we feel like we're not uh, heard, where uh, slowly and by degrees we are going to be forced to adopt or accept something we're not willing to accept. And uh, so I had been in these meetings over the last uh, week. And uh, they were convened by one of the bishops. And so, you know, we began to talk about, so what is the answer here? Now I will tell you, for three years I have been fundamentally opposed to any kind of division in the church. I have spoken against it. I have traveled thousands of miles to try to not see this happen. And um, what began to change for me was watching, first of all, Rule 44. We spent a day and a half debating whether we could have meaningful Christian conversation about this because it was a proxy for these other issues. Uh, so if it was approved, then that meant that we gave a little bit of leeway to the people who are more progressive. Well, we don't want to do that. 
Uh, and we think we don't trust each other, so we don't trust that the six people who are ultimately going to make the decisions to bring back to us are going to make the recommendations to bring back to us. We don't really trust them, and we don't trust the 60 people who appoint the six people. And so there's such a lack of trust, and, and that's true on both sides, that you know, we couldn't pass the ability to sit around tables and have conversations. So then we go into legislative committees. How many of you have been sitting in on legislative committees? Some of you have. So I think people thought, the moderates and progressives thought, okay, we're going to see a little bit of movement that allows some tension to be relieved in the system. But instead, the votes uh, continued to be for things that were even more regressive than what we've had in the past. So mandatory penalties if you officiated a same-gender wedding. Um, you know, in, in my legislative committee, we were, uh, one of the votes was to lift the one sentence that allowed, uh, that said, that prohibited same-gender weddings. So it just talked about marriage, but it, it lifted the prohibition against same-gender weddings. And I, I wasn't sure it would pass, but I thought it might pass out of our legislative committee. And it ended up being, uh, it was a very simple thing. It didn't, it didn't affirm same-gender marriage. It just took out the prohibition against same-gender marriage. And it was, uh, it was defeated 37 to 38. Of the, of the 37 to 38 who voted on that, 24 were from Africa. And so if it was just America and Europe and the Philippines, it would have been 37 to 13 in favor. Um, but what's clear is four years from now, the African bloc will be larger than it is today. And so that doesn't look like it's going to change. And even if the most conservative 10% leave, you still will find yourself outnumbered. In these, in these conversations. So I think a lot of people thought, well, you know, gosh, if some of the more conservative people leave, then that'll solve the problem. Interestingly enough, the math doesn't work anymore for that to solve the problem either. So the most conservative people could leave and you still end up with the same gridlock in 2020. And that's part of what shifted my thinking as I was sitting in these meetings about what do we do? And I began to think if no matter what, even if we send conservatives, you know, we allow them to go, we're still in the same stuck place. And it's not just homosexuality, it's a whole lot of other things. So four years ago, I led a charge to try to bring some change in our denominational structures, and we couldn't get that passed. Or if it did get passed, it got you know, uh, eliminated by the Judicial Council. We're at a place where it, it, it's just a very hard system to make this thing work. So the conversation began to be, uh, what if a special commission was appointed by this general conference that the bishops re recommended this and the general conference appointed a special commission whose job would be to take the next two years and develop a plan for, and this will be my language, not everybody else's language, a plan for, um, a plan for reordering the life of the people called Methodist in the United Methodist Church. That plan for reordering would create out of one United Methodist Church, potentially three new United Methodist Churches. And one would be the conservative United Methodist Church. Uh, one would be a church for those who are progressive who only want to be in a church with people who are progressive and will allow nothing less than full inclusion on everything. And for everybody, in other words, that every pastor needs to be doing same gender weddings. Every pastor, every church needs to host uh, same gender weddings. So if, if that's where you are and you say that's a justice issue and we really can't be with other people who are not like us on this. And then a church for what I, can, what I perceive to be the vast majority of United Methodists, which are somewhere in the middle, who are able to say we're going to allow churches and pastors with these convictions to be able to officiate same-gender weddings, annual conferences to make decisions about uh, who they'll ordain. This is basically the third way that was proposed by the Connectional Table. And we are going to also recognize that there are uh, faithful Christians who have a more conservative interpretation and provided that everybody is seeking to love uh, with justice, uh, we are not going to force those churches to adopt policies that are not in, in their conscience, you know, that don't line up with their conscience. And I think that would be 75% of our churches. And, um, and, and so then I'm sitting in these meetings and I'm like, I feel like I want to throw up when I'm thinking about this. Um, and I'm also thinking, I don't really see any other way that we're ever going to break past the gridlock. Then I begin to think, okay, what would happen if you could have a new church start with the denomination? What would happen if uh, we could come back and say, we're not just going to 
uh, let these other people go. We're going to rebirth the, the bigger, larger body of United Methodists. What would happen if we rebirth that and we wrote a brand new book of discipline? We didn't keep trying to adopt a 1968 book of discipline. What would happen if we could order our boards and agencies in such a way that they were missionally, perfectly missionally designed for the 21st century, not trying to tweak the ones that were designed for the middle of the uh, 20th century? And so, so with all of this, as a new church pastor, as somebody who started a new church from scratch, and you know the nimbleness that you have and the ability to adapt things, I thought, now that I could get excited about. I mean, despite the fact that I grieve this sort of losing, I could get, get excited if we could reorganize and reorder our denomination and start fresh. And, and I think you know, most United Methodist churches would be in that middle who would want to do that. Is any of this possible? I have no idea. I give it a 40% chance of passing General Conference to even form the commission. And if the commission is formed, then that has to have representatives from all of those various groups on there, appointed by those various groups, plus whoever else the bishops would assign. In two years, we would have a special called general conference for probably three days in which the plan or plans would be laid out and the general conference would vote. And it's entirely possible that they could vote to dissolve the United Methodist Church as we know it and the next day reopen under new management, or maybe not new management, but uh, something new, three different something news. Um, so, like I said, I don't even think it's likely that it will pass, but it's possible that it would pass. And the reason why it would pass is because people are increasingly frustrated and feel like there is no way out. We're stuck. And it might pass because you have people, leaders on the left, center, and right who are saying, we support this. It's not our will, but we support it. I was in a meeting yesterday uh, with some of the bishops and... Uh, one of the bishops said, you know, in your heart of hearts to the whole group, you know, do you really feel like this is where the Holy Spirit is leading? And I will tell you, my answer was, no, I don't believe this was God's will. I believe God's will was that we found some compromise, some way to be able to stand together and hold the tension. And, but if that can't happen, and so Leslie Weatherhead's written a wonderful, wrote a wonderful book a long time ago called The Will of God. I recently wrote the foreword for a new edition of it. And uh, he talks about God's ideal will, and then he says, but God's ideal will is subject to whatever we human beings choose to do. And, and then in the light of that, when human beings don't do whatever God's ideal will is, then there's God's circumstantial will. In this particular circumstance now, it's plan B. And then there's God's ultimate will, which will always prevail in the end. So uh, the church I pastor, and I'm going to shut up now and take questions, but the church I pastor is uh, we have about 10 to 11,000 people a weekend on an average, worship, average weekend. Um, that's at our four campuses in Kansas City and in our online campus. And we, uh, we are divided, as I said. Uh, we are not all in the same place. I have passionate people who are gay and lesbian, leaders in our congregation, who are like, Adam, please just stand up for full inclusion for everybody. I'm like, I am, and I want that. And at the same time, I recognize that we're all on this sort of journey about this. We see this in different ways at different places in our lives. I wasn't always where I stand today. And, uh, and when I ask some of my younger pastors, they're like, you know, why, you know, why don't we just tell people this is how it is? And I'm like, well, I'm regularly trying to help people see this the way I see it. But uh, I asked them, how long did it take you? Did you always hold the views that you hold? And my pastors are mostly in their 30s, uh, some are in their 20s, and some in their 50s and 60s. And, and those who hold this view, not all of our, we have 16 ordained pastors on staff, and not all of them hold this, uh, the same position. And they said, well, no, I didn't always feel this way. I said, well, what, what brought about the change for you? And they said, well, uh, it was getting my master's in divinity and, uh, and you know, getting to know lots and lots of people who are gay and lesbian. I said, so you think I can preach a 30-minute sermon on Sunday and change the minds of 11,000 people when they don't have a master of divinity degree, study the scriptures the way you've studied it, and they haven't built those relationships? It's not going to happen that way. And so on some issues, I think you just say to hell with it and you blow the church up because it's so important. I think this is an important issue, but I think it's an issue about which people are making, you know, our society is, is granting rights. Our, in our churches, people are wrapping their minds around and trying to understand how I think about this as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And I think it's a different approach. And, uh, and I think sometimes the things that we do, so now I'm gonna think about the demonstrations and I don't know what's coming. And some demonstrations are good. I mean, they really are important to shake you up. Uh, some can be so upsetting that it actually pushes people further from your position instead of drawing them into your fold. You want the kind of demonstrations that create, now this is me speaking, I could be wrong about this, that engender compassion 
and a sense of understanding and a desire to say, this just isn't right, we need to do something about it. It's possible that you can do something in such a way that you just alienate the other side. So I have tried to be this bridge between these two sides and say, come on, there's a way we can do this. We can hold this together. We can and, but I'm increasingly convinced that maybe on the ends, that's not going to work. So I, here's what I secretly hope happens. It's not much of a secret because I'm telling all of you. Um, I hope in the general conference sessions that the thought of dividing is so jarring to people that they say, you know what, what's that third way again that we voted down in legislative committee? Maybe that doesn't sound so bad after all. Maybe we can find some way to live together and allow some movement in this issue. Um, and if that gets brought up, and it's voted down, then for a lot of people they'll say, you know what, this really is the only way forward is for us to appoint a commission and start over. And uh, that would grieve me a lot, but that's, that may be where we're at. So, that's my spiel. Uh, I'd love to open it up for questions and see what questions you have. And Yes, and if you'd say your name and where you're from. Thank you, Pastor Adam, for, for coming and sharing your views. Um, uh, my name is Mark Silvasio, and I'm a first year MDiv student at Drew. And uh, my question is, um, in your book, When Christians Get It Wrong, you said that if we don't get the issue, the LGBT issue right, we will lose the next generation. Haven't we already lost the next generation? Hmm, that's a good question. Actually, we lost the previous generation. And so since we lost my generation, um, their children we also lost along the way. And that was actually a very different time for very different reasons we lost them. And the loss wasn't about same gender relationships. The loss was, uh, was about a message and a way of connecting and worshiping with people that didn't connect with the generation that was following, I think. I mean, it was a lack of vitality in many of our churches. There, there was a lack of, uh, for many, a deep personal faith that might draw them into a life transforming uh, relationship with Christ. It was a Sort of, we're going to collect peanut butter jars, as a, you know, uh, have a peanut butter drive as opposed to really working for justice. I mean, on both sides, we didn't get either the evangelical or the social gospel side very well. And so my generation was lost largely to uh, more evangelical churches. So we saw the swell of uh, church attendance and growth in the 1970s and 1980s, but they ended up going to other, other fellowships. So we lost that generation and are working, our new churches are working to get them back. So Church of the Resurrection is made up largely of that generation that was lost, because this happens to be my generation. Um, I think that, that at our best, our approach to the gospel as United Methodists might be the best approach we have for reaching a younger generation. That is a gospel that has both an intellectual component and a heart component that emphasizes the social gospel as well as the personal gospel and that is, uh, has a large dose of grace. Um, so I think even if we changed on this issue, because uh, I hear people say, you know, we're, gonna, we, we're, we're not gonna reach young people if we don't change on this issue. We can change on this issue, we're still not gonna reach young people if we haven't figured out how to do church in a way, how to preach, minister, organize church, lead worship in a way that connects with a younger generation of people. Um, so this isn't the magic answer, but it is true that an increasing number, 70, according to the latest, uh, uh, Pew Center Research, 75% of millennials uh, see this issue more progressively. And, and so when you're talking about young adults and you are saying what the church has traditionally said on this issue, there are a significant number of them who say, are you kidding me? Because for them it's instantly bigotry. And you're asking me to participate in a church that sanctions bigotry? I'm not going to do that. So this is a huge hurdle. Um, at Church of the Resurrection, we have probably 2,000 millennials who are part of our congregation. And um, every last year at General Conference, when we voted the way we did, I had some of my brightest and best young people who are planning on ordained ministry. And they came and said, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can be United Methodist anymore if this is the United Methodist position. I'm now looking at the Episcopal Church PCUSA, ELCA, other churches that are, that are in a different place. So I think that's true for 75% of our millennials. Um, but I think our stuck, and they stuck and they said, we recognize that you care about this issue and that what you teach is different than what 
is in the Book of Discipline, and that's part of why we want to be a part of this congregation. I'm going to come back here to Marquise and then back over here. Hey, Marquise. We were on the same legislative committee together. Yeah, we were. That was fun. Um, Marquise Hobbs, uh, Texas A&M Conference. It was fun. I did learn a lot. It was a little more fun for your side. You won some of the votes. Right, lost, right. So. Um, so my question is, uh, when we think about the issues concerning um, LGBTQ communities and then uh, the two kind of sides, with progressive and conservative, do you think that moving forward as a United Methodist Church with those varying theologies that we could, under the same umbrella, have two theologies about this issue? Um, and I know that we are global and we have our differences, but as uh, one of our brothers from the Congo was saying, um, he was talking about filtering everything through the Bible. And if these two theologies are trying to do that and one comes out progressive and one comes out conservative, um, how can the United Methodist Church really have two theologies concerning the same thing? Yeah. Um, or can they? Is yeah. the question. So, thank you. Uh, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Making Sense of the Bible, which was really aimed at uh, asking this question. And the really underlying question is, what is the nature of Scripture? Uh, what is this book? Uh, what is the nature of Scripture? What do we mean when we say it's inspired? What did the early church mean by that? How did the early church interpret their own scriptures? Because for Paul, there was no New Testament. It was just the Hebrew Bible. And so it's an interesting exercise to look to see what, how did the early church treat their text? And, uh, and what did Paul mean in 2 Timothy 3.16 when he said all scripture is inspired by God? And by the way, that's a text that probably means something different than it's usually quoted as meaning. At least I believe that. Um, so, is it possible for us to interpret Scripture differently and still remain one church? That's really the question. And underneath that may be the question of what is the nature of Scripture. But here's the thing. I don't think we're as far apart on the nature of Scripture as we think we are because United Methodists have already said of Scripture, let's just say uh, women in the Bible. And so Paul devotes twice as many verses to talk about the proper role of women in the church than he does to talking about anything that might be connected to modern-day same-gender relationships. Twice as many of those verses, and they're, they're just unambiguous. Uh, let the women keep silent in the church, you know, th these kinds of passages. Uh, as for me, I don't allow a woman to teach a man. And you know that there are lots of churches today who continue to abide by that because they are biblical Christians. And, but we have looked at that and said, well, no, there's room for us to interpret that and to ask questions about these particular texts. And just because Paul wrote it doesn't mean it expresses the timeless and, and eternal will of God. It may be that it captures the culture in which Paul is living and Paul's understanding of that culture rooted and grounded in his own understanding of the creation story. So he, he roots this not just in culture. He roots this in the creation story in Adam and Eve. And so maybe Paul's interpretation of that story might not really reflect who, you know, and so I asked a Nigerian bishop yesterday, I said, who said, you know, the word of God says this, and you're, you know, how in the world can I go back to Nigeria and tell them that Methodists have violated the word of God and have said this? I said, can I just ask you a question? Do you have women preachers in Nigeria? Yes. I said, come on, Bishop. We know that, that it's not just the word of God says it, and therefore, first of all, if you study the scripture, you're going to find the phrase the word of God hardly ever, if ever, refers to a written book. So in the book of Acts, the apostles preached the word of God, and it doesn't say that they quote something from the Hebrew Bible. They're telling the story of Jesus. So John tells us Jesus is the word of God. The definitive, unmitigated, inerrant word of God is Jesus Christ. And then the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ is the word of God. And you remember John the Baptist is in the wilderness and it says the word of the Lord came to him. But that wasn't a scroll that dropped out of heaven. It was a message that was pent up burning in his bones, right? And so, uh, so part of what we have to be able to do is say, let's just be clear about how we're looking at it. I asked the bishop, I said, Bishop, there are over 300 verses in the Bible that affirm and regulate slavery. So if there are 300 verses in the Bible that affirm and regulate slavery, and yet you and I both agree that slavery is contrary to God's will, then how do we, how do we deal with that? And we deal with that because we recognize the complexity of our book. So we already are doing this. Conservatives and progressives and moderates are already recognizing the complexity of our book and, and recognize the need to interpret it. I had... One young man at a conference I was speaking at, he was a, a new seminary graduate. 
And he said, well, it sounds to me like you're picking and choosing. This is the easy way to sort of critique this model of interpretation. So you're picking and choosing. And, uh, and I shared with him a story from A.J. Jacobs, who was a, a non-practicing Jew. He was the editor of Esquire magazine. And he decided that he would, for a year, live every single passage in the Hebrew Bible as best as he could. So it was an experiment. He decided to do this. And, and in the mornings, he would put pebbles in his pocket. And when he, was, when he saw somebody doing something that you were supposed to stone them for, he would toss a little pebble at them. <laughs> and uh, he let his beard grow and his hair grow. And, and he tried to follow all the co every single law, all 623 of them in the Hebrew Bible. And, uh, and he uh, notes in his book, he wrote a, a book called The Year of Living Biblically. And he notes in his book that he um, came home one, one day, and his wife was so irritated that he was, they were having to live this way, and she was frustrated. And, uh, and she said, by the way, I want you to know I'm on my period right now. And, uh, and the Hebrew Bible says that if a woman is on her period, you can't sit in the seat that she sat on because it becomes unclean, or lay in the bed that she's laid on because it becomes unclean. And so she said, uh, AJ, I want you to know I'm on my period. And then she proceeded to sit in every single seat in the entire house. <laughs> And, uh, and so he started carrying a folding chair with him, you know, when he'd come home for that week of the month when she was on her period. And he said, I got to the end of that year, and one thing became clear to me. Everybody picks and chooses. The important thing is to choose the right things. And I wouldn't call it picking and choosing. I would call it interpreting, rightly dividing the word of Scripture. And so, uh, so when we do that, I think there's room for us to be able, if we could acknowledge that, then we can say it's possible to interpret these scriptures more conservatively, or it's possible to interpret these scriptures more progressively. But I think we already, uh, we already, Marquise, agree that the Bible's more complex than that. And I was talking with another friend last night, and she said, you know, you and I read the scripture the same way. She said, I agree with everything you just said. I just happen to see this trajectory of scripture that points towards, you know, heterosexuality. And I said, yes, that's the norm. Absolutely. Nobody can argue with that. I mean, our plumbing works this way. This is the trajectory we see in scripture. The question is, how does God look at his gay and lesbian children? And what does God, or God not allow or does allow? And when we go back to the creation story, we find God looks at the man and he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make for him a helper as his companion. And that's where, where marriage is rooted and grounded. And if you're trying to do Christian weddings and you start looking for all the Bible verses that teach you about marriage, you're going to find about nothing that's clearly telling you, you know, that this is designed to give you the, the you know, the, the answer, it's hard to find passages to use in wedding ceremonies until you start going, wait, I have to think theologically about these passages. And then suddenly you can find things that speak to us. And I, uh, Ben Wetherington, who's at uh, Asbury United Methodist, Sem or Asbury Seminary, uh, I wrote something a couple weeks ago. He responded and he talked about, you know, Jesus is clear on this issue. He makes it clear, and I forget the passage in Matthew, uh, about, uh, you know, God made the male and female. And, and but in that passage, uh, Jesus is answering the question about divorce. There wasn't somebody who came to him and said, well, tell us what you think about gay marriage. That wasn't even thought of in, in the Hebrew culture. Uh, he's answering a different question. I've, I've done 350 weddings so far in my ministry. Every single wedding I, quote, I tell the story of the, of the creation of Adam and Eve, which I see as an archetypal story. But it tells us something about what we're doing in this. But just because I cite that story and preach from it every single time I do a wedding doesn't mean I then apply that to same gender relationship and say, there's no room for this in God's plan or economy. Um, anyway, thanks for asking the question. It's a good question. But so my answer, and the, sh the short answer is yes, I think there's room for us to disagree on how we interpret and still I be in the same I church. Need to interrupt yep. This time. Um, we've got 12 minutes before worship begins. Um, we're off of live stream, but the session is continuing to be recorded. Uh, so we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Okay, uh, and you want to pick the people who want to, let, let's, let's go, I'm going to go with the woman, then I'm going to come back uh, with you right over here. So I don't care, any of you three over there, you can arm wrestle each other. Come on, somebody stand up, and whoever stands up first, jump up. Okay. Yeah, get to the microphone so they can catch on. I'm pretty loud. Um, my name's Jade Rasband, and I'm from Candler, um, and then from the Alabama West Florida Conference, and mine isn't as much theological as it is practical. So if we obviously, like, people disagree on this issue, like we've said, um, and so if we go with the third way or some kind of, like, restructuring, what does that do for appointments? 
obviously like so you have a church somewhere for like six someone at a church for six years and then all of a sudden what does that do to the congregation what does that do to their marriage policies if they get another pastor thrown in there who has either side of a differing opinion yeah. um and just kind of thinking critically about what that means of how we do itineracy yeah it's a really so. great question so uh here's the thing that already happens superintendents and cabinets sit down and ask uh, is this pastor progressive, moderate, or conservative? You know, what is their, where are they theologically? And then they ask, is this church progressive, moderate, or conservative? And ideally, now they really mess up when they say, well, we're going to go make this church Methodist by sending somebody there to change them. I mean, that hardly ever works. It usually is a recipe for just messing up a church. Um, but they, they typically are saying, let's assign, if we have a church that's a reconciling ministries congregation, we're not going to send a conservative Methodist pastor to that church. We already do this. And so my answer would be that that becomes part of what you take into account is, uh, is does this pastor line up with that particular church? And, and you're going to find that's going to sh sort of shake itself out over time. Um, but let's not kid ourselves. Pastors do shape the theology of a church. If they're an effective pastor over a period of time, they will do that. Uh, if they're ineffective pastor, they won't, but if they are effective pastor. So in my community, there's a PCUSA church that uh, had been moderate to progressive since it was started 50-some years ago. And, uh, but the last pastor they brought in, they were just looking for a good preacher. They didn't really care what their theology was. They brought in a pastor who was a good preacher, but he was much more conservative and over a period of years moved the church to the place where last year, two years ago, they voted to leave the PCUSA but when they did, there were still several hundred moderates in the church who couldn't believe they were voting to leave the denomination that they started this church in. And so it ended up being a split. And the courts then decided who got the building, and the smaller group got to keep the building in the PCUSA, and it was just a disaster. This is why bishops will have to be careful about. But I think they already try to do that. I don't think it'll be, you know, there'll be enough churches on both sides that there'll be places for people to go. Yeah, yes, back here in the back. Thank you, Reverend Hamilton. Um, and What's your I just, name? My name is Guthrie Graves hey, Fitzsimmons. I'm a student at Union Theological awesome. Seminary. Cool. And I wanted to ask about your role, and I'm thankful for your role as sort of a bridge builder in the denomination, but your role as a local church pastor. Yeah. Um, now that same-sex marriage is legal in Kansas, um, would you officiate or have you officiated a, a same-sex wedding? And if not, what sort of what would get you there, and then would you sponsor a out person in minute, you know through the process, right. or on your staff as an associate? Yeah, because that's a great question. So here's uh, here is the answer that I've given to our pastors: is right now, if we're trying to be bridge builders, then we're going to follow the discipline, mm -hmm. and we're going to advocate for different ways of reading the scripture. So we're going to stand and and say, you know, all of the things I've tried to write in books, all of the ways that I've tried to lead forward, and at the same time. If, if I, and so I'm, I don't wear the stoles. I don't wear the stoles because I'm still trying to figure out how can I be somebody who's going to bring these two sides together. And I feel like once I've firmly identified over here, even though people know where I stand, our congregation, they all know where I stand on this issue. Uh, and they all know, and our gay and lesbian members all know this is a place where Pastor Adam welcomes us, wants to work towards our having the full ability to be able to marry in the United Methodist Church. Um, when that day comes, when we are, and, it, and I'm, I'm not sure that if we do nothing, the day's not going to come where our pastors are not going to begin to do uh, to officiate same gender weddings and break the discipline. But for right now, I've said I want you to. You can participate. You can be a part of the ceremonies. You can read scripture. You can do all these things that the bishops have said you can do. But I'm going to ask you to obey the the disciplinary rules, and um, and so I do think the day will come where we will, where our pastors and our church will embrace this. At the same time, I'm, I'm, and this will sound really horrible, but I think I'm going to have our associates do that first with my permission so that I can continue to try to be a pastor to the 40% of our congregation members who are struggling to get there. They've come a long way. Like, they're all, they will all tell me, okay, look, you've stretched me. I'm like, I totally see this issue differently than I used to, but I'm not where you are yet. You know, I'm not there. And so because I have 16 pastors, I think when the day would come where this would be within the United Methodist Church allowed and or, I mean, if it came to breaking the discipline, I would probably do that instead of having them do that. But I, I just think I can see where I'm trying to lead our congregation and I can see they're making progress in that direction. I don't want to blow up my church either. If I had, if I, I lost one year 
in 2004, right after General Conference, I came back and preached on same-gender relationships and shared my struggle with trying to make sense of this, but here's where I stand. And we had 800 people leave the church in 12 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, those 800 people, many of them were people I loved. I had led to Jesus. I had baptized them. And I would get letters from them saying, I just can't trust you with, with the word of God anymore. And I just, I can't tell you. It was, I, I've never been depressed, I mean, for a long period of time. And I went through about a year of depression where I thought, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be a pastor. Maybe I disappointed God. I don't know. That's what all these people say, I disappointed God. And I'll just tell you, it hurts like hell when you have 800 people leave your church. And it would have been easier if they'd all left on the same day, but they left over a period of 12 months, so I just kept getting these letters every single week. And, uh, and so I, I don't want to see us. I don't, I, the fact is we're moving in this direction, and I'm not willing to blow up the church, my church or the United Methodist Church entirely when I can see this is the progress that's being made. And so we are a place that's, welcomes everyone. We are a place that everybody in the congregation and in the Kansas City area, I mean, we're the gay church in Kansas City, you know, which is just an interesting dynamic um, in a red state and in a really red county in a red state. But what we are is we're a church that's going to welcome everybody who's going to walk in the door. So good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'm going to take the mic. I'm sitting right here. One second. Uh, uh, I'm more on the conservative side. Uh, because I was born and raised in India, yeah. and for me to preach that in Indian congregation, they will storm me to death. And uh, United Methodist is growing in Africa and South Asia, China and uh, India and all these places. For me, being here is very hard, so I'm coming very close as a uh, build bridger. But for those people, even the little people in America has this problem. Just think about those people. Yeah. How many years going to take for them to come close? Right. And where is God in this then? Right. So uh, this will be our last answer. So uh, I want to say two things to that. First of all, that's absolutely true. And so that whole pro the, the place where resurrection is and the fact that we're a place that's going to welcome. And what I'm affirming is we're going to be a church that's going to welcome both sides of this. That we're going we're gonna to have to be able to say it's okay to be more conservative on this issue and that that's a way of interpreting scripture that is faithful. The, um, and I think this is particularly true, you go outside of the United States, in Africa, in uh, I think in places in the Philippines, in Russia. So we, we're, we're blind if we're not recognizing that. We've got to allow room for that. And I want to, that's what I've been trying to advocate for. At the same time, there is also a place where, so uh, in Africa, and my Nigerian bishop friend said, 15 years prison sentence if you are caught in a relationship. And I asked the bishop, I said, so I don't care how you feel about same-gender relationships, how are you not speaking up and saying it's wrong to put people in prison for being in a gay relationship? How, you know, we can't just say, there's not some place where we have to also say, the scripture says, speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves. And I think there has to be a place for enough boldness to say, okay, I'm conservative on this issue, but it's wrong to put people in prison because they're gay or lesbian. It's wrong to persecute people. I, I was in Zimbabwe, and a pastor came up to me and said, you know, I have a woman who's lesbian in my church. Nobody knows it. She's afraid that she could be put to death for this. What should I do? I mean, this is the world in which we're living. And so we can't just say, well, let's just let everybody else, you know. I mean, somewhere there's a place to say, yes, you might hold these views, but you cannot think that you treat human beings this way. And so I would, I'm going to say both of those things. I'm going to say we allow we make room for both conservatives and progressives in the church. But we also have to speak up to say we're not in favor of people denied human, basic human rights and we are against people being persecuted because they're gay or lesbian. Y'all, thank you so much for allowing me to hang out with you today. And, uh, and I would ask that you continue to pray for the United Methodist Church. And I'm excited that you want to pursue a career in ministry in the United Methodist Church. I think it has a really bright future but it will only because people like you are willing to explore new ways of doing ministry and you have a passion for reaching people for Christ and pursuing social justice at the same time. And that's the gospel that will reach 21st century people. God bless. Thank you.